Hello and welcome back to the OMG MotoGP podcast. We are getting ever nearer to the start of the season. Uh, thank you for all the kind comments as well on the new team look. Really excited to have uh, Amy and Renita on board as well. We'll be seeing a lot of them uh, as we get into our uh, race previews and reviews throughout the season. Uh, but we have the opportunity right now uh, to sit down with Dorna's Chief Commercial Officer, uh, Dan Rosamundo. Really excited for this one. So Keith and I caught up with him uh, a little earlier. Dan, thanks so much for, for taking the time to join the show. Where, whereabouts in the world are you joining us from? Uh, it's a pleasure. I'm in um, wintry New Jersey. I'm home for a week seeing the family who is um, obviously the kids are thrilled. They had a snow day yesterday. Or um, So yeah, we're home in New Jersey for a week before I go to the Doha test this coming weekend. Oh, very nice. Now, I did yeah. say new chief commercial officer. Obviously, you've been <laughs> in the role for, for a little while. Well, not a little while now, but a few over a few months. Um, sure. How, how, have those, how have those first opening months been with Dorna and, and experiencing, I suppose, two-wheeled motorsport and the, the pinnacle of it? <laughs> yeah, it's been, it's, been all, it's been a little over 10 months. I, I mean, I feel like it's a baby. I, when do I start saying years? At least I'm gone from weeks yeah. uh, to months. Um, it's been a little bit over 10 months and it's been frankly exhilarating in a lot of ways, both personally and professionally. Um, I will, I have told people and I will say this with all honesty and without remorse, I was not a motorsport fan before I started this and I've started now dabbling um, or dabbling in all different motorsports. So I was watching the NASCAR series on Netflix last night. So yeah, no, but it's been a great 10 months. The organization's fantastic. I think the sport is wonderful and uh, from so many reasons. Um, so it's been a whirlwind to say the least, but it's been great. It's been really great. I was going to use another analogy. I was going to say into the fire pit, I would suggest um, from where you are at the moment. I mean, a chief commercial officer, I mean, that wraps up quite a lot of, a lot of jobs that um, have got to be done. And I think with Dorna, and MotoGP in a lot of marketplaces since we since Valentino Rossi retired has kind of flatlined. And there's a lot of people, promoter-wise, that are concerned about where we're going commercially. Yeah. Um, and, and that is a, a massive issue, particularly here in Britain, I've got to say. 45,000 people through the gate last year is a major worry. Yes. Um, Silverson having just signed an extra 10 years on their Formula One contract. But I can almost see, you know, here, it not going for very much longer. Yeah in this country if I might stick my neck you out can stick, you can stick whatever um, you want with out. that kind of happening when you've only got 45,000 people coming through the gate on race day um, that's a serious problem I mean in my day it was 120,000 yeah. people at Donington or Silverstone or well it was at Silverstone for, for, for me back in the day but I mean I think that, that Donington you know MSVR which is Jonathan Palmer I mean he's he's not a slow man on his feet that's for certain JP will be looking to see if he can pick off anything that's left over um, but to be honest, Silverstone is a fantastic it venue. Is, it is. Um, you know, and Stuart Pringle and the team for Formula One do a fantastic yeah. job, but they seem to have had, you know, more opportunity with Formula One. It's a bigger sport. So, you know, I think we're all fairly agreed on that. It is a bigger sport. It's not a bigger spectacle. That's a fact. MotoGP is a bigger spectacle than Formula One, right. in my view. I know I might be a bit biased. Um, but all the same, it's a big task when you've only got a, a, an interest factor of 45,000 yeah. people. I mean, I don't, I don't understand, and you being fairly new to the sport, have got a, a fairly uphill slope to try and turn that around. I wonder how you might be, might be looking at doing okay, it. Okay, I think the first, um, the first challenge with any new role, but something that I've um, acutely identified here is you have to recognize where the challenges are. You can't just go whistling by the graveyard. That's not something that, is helpful to anyone. You have to actually, and you can't just say, oh, it'll be fine. Or, or it's someone else's challenge. I think that we have, as while we have Silverstone in a, not the optimal situation, we've had other places that we have record crowds. So we, sometimes we have to sort of, it's the ones that are the problems or the, the challenges that you have to focus more time on. And we've started to do that. I mean, we've, we're looking at different ways to bring more people into Silverstone. I don't. I wouldn't say it's the best time of the year for them or us. I think it's a challenge. August is not um, the easiest month, even though it's supposedly warm. I've had my the coldest I've ever been was a summer in Silverstone. Um, 
I think we have to identify what that opportunity is because the UK is such a, and it's got a great bike history and we have to identify that we've identified that market as one that we have to um, work on acute challenges in that area so that we can make it more, we can have that spectacle seen by others. And you'll see some, we've done some work, we're doing some more and you'll see, I think you'll see the fruits of the labor. I'm not sure if it's going to be this year, but in the next year to come, I think you'll see it because we are, we have put our head down on that market. And the United States is another market. Um, there's a few, we have our core markets, Keith, Iberia, France, pretty darn strong there. Then we have our opportunity markets, the US, the UK, Germany, India, Southeast Asia. Those are where we feel like we are under commercialized or at least uh, under, um, we either under viewed or under commercialized. Sometimes those go hand in hand. So we have to identify them and um, we have identified them. We have to then just get to the job of building out the sport and the, and the business. I mean, do you, are we moving east or west? I mean, no. it's, uh, have you been, do you feel that you've been brought in as an American? Obviously the American market is huge, yes. but we've, we've never really tapped no. it. I mean, it's just never really happened in America. Indy was a strange venue for us, brilliant venue um, for anything pretty much other than motorbikes. bikes. Yes. Um, Laguna Seca, everybody loved Laguna Seca, but it's unsafe and it can't be, no. it can't be rectified in that particular way. There's some fantastic racetracks in America. Moto America, Wayne Rainey set up. You know, they go to some great places, but we could never go to them because they're too dangerous. They don't reach the criteria. Yes. So we're kind of screwed on that front. But I mean, as an American, do you feel that, that maybe Dorna, who have been accused of being Spanish-centric for years, even though I am a personal, I think Dorna have done a fantastic job with our sport over a great period of time. They just seem to have run out of steam. And I, I know that Harry and I discussed this many times about the uh, drive to survive um, effort that was made yeah. on the cheap um, and done terribly, uh, and a massively missed opportunity for, for quite a large marketplace there. But do you feel that you've been brought in as an American really to, to enhance the American side of things or is it really a global situation? Are you picking off uh, specific areas specifically? Yeah. Oof. God, that is... That is the existential question, frankly. And I, it, it, it has been, um, I do think the alluring part of the role, and it still is, and it's still the, what I think is the massive opportunity is that we are a global sport. There's so many sports out there that claim to be global sports that really are just one country and they sort of resonate maybe in a couple more of their players might be from other countries. But we actually talk the talk and walk the walk. So we have to, to use... To, to kind of go back with your metaphor, I I need to put the coal in the uh, pipe and you know get 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 the engine going again. And I think there's kindred spirits inside of Dorna who recognize that. Keith, to be quite honest, I think yeah, an American was probably a profile they wanted. But I really I, I and I give all the credit to Carmelo and Enrique and Carlos is that they really wanted someone who was going to look at things differently, who was going to energize um, different parts of the business. Who was and that what I maybe they didn't expect, you know. Listen, I'm a very I I'm a very blunt person in so many ways. I'm from New Jersey. I worked at the NBA. I worked in New York all my life. I, I don't have I don't suffer fools very well. So I come in and I say, listen, these are the things that we have to work on. And there's not been a no yet. There hasn't been a no. There's been a yeah. Let's go. Just do it. Go. So I've got a lot of support, but I also have to. It's got to be an evolution, not a revolution. Because to your point, the sport is really good. I mean, the this, this sport is really good. Like, it's exciting. And if you know, like, F1 might be bigger, but I would say that if you were a racing fan of both, you probably think our racing's better. You probably think our racing's better. So what I have to do is I have to be that evangelist for the sport in a lot of ways in the business community. We do have to pick our spots though, Keith. I will say that we can't be everywhere. We, we just can't, we can't physically capture every piece of data and take on every single project in every market everywhere. It's not physically possible. We have, you know, 400 odd people at Dorna. We put on 21 GPs a year. That's a spectacle. That's a size thing in itself. So what I'm also recognizing is prioritization. And I do think the United States only because, and this is me, the sportsman, I think the sport is kind of made for the U S market. It's 45 minutes. Our races are 45 minutes. 
it's, yeah. it's balls to the walls. It's like it's like courage and her hero, heroism. So from that perspective, yeah, I would. Is there a lot of money in the U.S.? Of course. But like I do think like the American people just say, "Whoa, what is this?" So I, I've got to pick my spots. But yeah, the U.S. and Southeast Asia because of the bike market and the fandom there is just off the chart. The avidity is like ridiculous. So it's got to be a little bit of both. We got to walk and chew gum. In that vein, then, though, yeah, much like Formula One, you know, we they, they battled with America for quite some time. Then it fell off the calendar. Yeah. Then Austin, yeah. Texas came and and slowly rejuvenated, and and now that's become a real mainstay of of the F one calendar at least. And then Drive to Survive helped really boost it to the American market. And now yeah, we have three three American circuits on the grid for now. Like Vegas and Miami for now for now for now <laughs> well it, it sounds like well Chicago's gearing up yeah. who knows maybe another one but yeah. in that similar vein especially in MotoGP with uh, you know track house coming into MotoGP well, for this year could we is this the beginning of actually seeing not only an American team next up an American rider next up more american tracks and an even enlarged calendar can you see the calendar expanding to what it already is oof that's well let's take it let's take that sorry i chucked i chucked a lot at you there sorry questions there were like four questions in there (laughs) (laughs) it's early it's early here let me let me um... no the reason the reason why he's put them in there dan is because he doesn't get a chance Ah, when i'm yakking yeah that's true (laughs) well done well done no all right so let's start with um the american rider we would love an american rider it's not something you can snap your fingers at. It's gonna, it's a bill. We've got to work with Moto America. We got to work with Trackhouse to get it. You know, would it probably galvanize it the market more quickly? Yes. Is it a is it a safety issue? Yeah. You just can't fake it. You can't fake it and put an American who's not ready for MotoGP on that bike. So we are going to work on that. But it's a little bit of a longer burn than other things. In terms of the calendar, I think we're pretty happy with the size of the the the, the number of races, the number of events that we have. Will we look at some optimization inside of that calendar? Absolutely. Are there is there interest from U.S. Um, entrepreneurs to build circuits that will be homologated for us? Absolutely. And would we expand? Yeah, all of that. So yes, we would. Uh, I figure out and then look the drive to survive phenomenon that helped Formula One is hard to replicate. You know, mm-hmm. it's hard to replicate. If you go to Netflix right now, Harry, and go to sports documentaries. Look at them all. But look, there's only been one that's kind of had this um, cultural phenomenon, that has been a cultural phenomenon like Drive to Survive and actually amped up the business. So I think that's hard. And I would to- say actually that was also due to the pandemic. A lot of people forget because everyone's suddenly stuck indoors with nothing to do. So what's on the telly? Oh, oh I'll see this F1 Drive to Survive thing. So yeah. in, in everybody else's defense, that I think that people overlook that that is actually what helped F1 quite a lot. Yeah, I mean, listen... I don't want to say anything, but you know, March March fourteenth is coming around. We had this global pandemic four years ago. The Chiefs and the 49ers were in the Super oh, Bowl no. four years ago. I'm I've just saying, this. maybe we can. No, I'm kidding. Um, no, I think um, <laughs> I think that, that that helped as well. But for uh, for what I and I think this goes to Harry's question too is we are we are we want to we want to get things right. Okay, we want to. We want to get things right. We don't want to um, be a. I don't. I think stunts are cute, but I don't think stunts have longevity. So when we look at the U.S. market, it's okay. How do we get things right? How do we build stuff out? I think Trackhouse will be a huge help for us uh, in terms of this. There, the way they approach the business and the sport, they'll be a help for us in that market. Um, and there's some other things that we're working on that a little bit too early to to announce here, but I think that that, that'll help with. Um, exposure and things like that as well. So the U.S. is important because it's also, it's a mouthpiece, sort of like London. London's a mouthpiece for Europe. The U.S. is a mouthpiece for the world. So we need to get both of them engaged, but we have to get it right. We have to get it right. Well, let's talk about yeah. that. You talk about stunt. I mean, was sprint racing on a Saturday a stunt to start with? Um, I know that's going to be a matter of opinion, and it's one that's a bit 50-50 yeah. in a lot of cases at the moment. Um, the other point being is that, that I personally believe that we've got a bit of Bernieism going on in uh, in 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 Dorna, in that uh, in that um, digital, which is massive. I mean, Dorna are innovative. Sergi Sendra and his team 
are probably the best in the world for producing onboards and behind the scenes stuff. They have, they've got brilliant technology that they're selling around the world. And yet the digital offering for my money isn't good enough. I don't believe Dorna's digital offering is good enough. We've got geo blocking all over the place, which drives everybody bonkers. No one can log into anything anywhere. Um, I'm sure you're going to have a hand on, on some of that. In fact, I've seen a few um, um, big thumbs up for Dan Rossomundo yes. regarding um, that, that you've unblocked a few yeah. bits and pieces. But it does seem to me that that, that side of things, and, and again, if I talk about Sky Television, particularly in, in the UK, Sky Television's biggest offering uh, at one point was their digital platform. Yeah. They valued that almost as highly as they did the televisual side yeah. of things because I think they could see back in the day that that was where we were all moving well, toward. How people receive their 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 sport yep. is is changing massively. But do, do you feel that Dorna yourself, you know, in the future, are doing enough regarding the digital offering? And, no. and, and presumably, you've got some fairly big plans regarding that moving no. forward. We're not doing enough, and we're not doing it well enough. It, we'll, but it's not something we're going to rest on. Our, we're not going to say. That's, it is what it is. So yeah. So you you mentioned some things that we've we've looked at and addressed. I think there's going to be some other things as well. I think um, there's a big. This is not going to unfortunately translate to you guys because you, I don't know if you've ever seen the movie, but there's a movie called Field of Dreams with Kevin Costner, and the line was, "If you build it, they will come." Well, that is not the way it works with sports content. No, if you not. build it, they might not come. Okay, you need to <laughs> distribute that content and get it out there. So listen, I. I think that, and I will go back to my interview with Carmelo in February of last year, or January, I don't even know what it was last year, where I said to him, you guys don't have enough swagger with your content. You just don't. You just don't have it out there enough. You don't have it optimized. And I think our team recognizes that. And we have some legacy um, infrastructure things that we're working on, but we also have a mindset that we're changing too. Um, so you've seen a little bit of changes in terms of um, – how we are asking people to register to watch videos and how we are now not asking people to register to watch videos, which is a big thing. Um, you know, the geo blocking is something that obviously we're addressing as well. I talked about the benefits of being a global sport earlier. <laughs> the curse of being a global sport is that your rights, your rights management is all over the board. So you have to really get into that and make sure you're protecting the folks who are, it's a really fine line, Keith, between the guys who are actually, you want to expose your sport to as many people as possible, but you have certain parties who are paying you a lot of money and you have to make sure that they're going to continue to pay that so you can do the other stuff you want. But I do think we're innovative. Sergi is great at kind of like bringing this sport. I mean, the amount of things that we have done that other sports have mimicked, I mean, is amazing. So we have to have a digital offering that matches that innovation and that technology, technological gravitas. And we're going to get there. We're going to get there. Do you collaborate much? I mean, Dorna obviously own World Superbike yeah. as well. Um, you know, spreading it out. World Superbike is supposed to be one notch down from, yep. from MotoGP. Um, but I can see a time coming fairly soon with hardcore fans where World Superbikes are going to be start mounting a challenge regarding um, what we watch, um, particularly with the way things are heading at the moment with, with the, the, the riders that have got in there. I mean, MotoGP is the pinnacle. Um what is that collaboration? Have you got a strategy between the two to try and keep that differential between them? Because as on the technical side, uh, well, I, think I can't speak to the technical on the stuff, promotional I, side. I on, can't, the technical I can't side on, technical. on the technical side, on the offering side. Yeah, <laughs> I can't spell technical. I was saying so. No, um, on the um, I would say on the consumer side, yes, we we do collaborate. You know, all of the folks that run the business lines for my group, work, you know, all of the, all of those P and Ls from World Superbike roll up into me, and we we deal with the guys and. Rome and whoever they might be, and Gregory and um, Francesco and the team. So it's it's really good in that regard. Uh, I think we've learned some stuff from them. If you've seen this year when we did the sprints, we put the podiums in the paddock. That is something that World Superbike did. So <laughs> I am not afraid to look at good ideas and say we need to do that. Um, you know, so we are. We definitely do collaborate. I think that their sport is um, it is it is a little bit like the little engine that could. It just keeps going, and it's really it's really good for that Matt, from in that regard. So it's uh, it's also uh, I think from my perspective, they have a have us have a, a fan that pr overlaps with us more than we have a fan that overlaps with them. Hmm. 
the, do you the, have a collaboration with the teams, team bosses, team management, team PR? Do, yeah. Do, 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 yeah. I mean, normally, normally they're the thorn in the side of, of somebody like Dorna because they're all, it's like herding cats. They're all over the bloody place. <laughs> yeah. Teams, um, teams are, um, well, by the way, and that's and the other thing I, I had, I continue to reiterate to my, my team, my organization is that this is not a Dorna specific problem. Teams everywhere are the thorn in your side. I mean, I've come from the NBA for 30 years. I've, I've worked in hockey. I've worked in baseball. Like teams are, yeah, they want to, they, you know, there's always this tension between teams and governing body or teams and league. It just, it exists. It, it, it is there. There's the ones who you want to be more innovative and the ones you want to say, just, can you just relax for a second? There's both. So yeah, we do have, we, we want to foster an open dialogue. I think Keith, one of the probably, the best thing that I did this past year was just walk up and down the paddock every chance I got. Every chance I got, like if there was a lull in my calendar, I'd walk out of the uh, office or the truck and just start walking down the paddock and I would see a team boss or a communication person or a PR specialist, a rider, a father of a rider, a commentator, and just talk about what they saw, what they thought, because I had so much to learn and that's not going to stop. So I think the conversation and the dialogue that we have with teams is very healthy. Uh, it's just, we have to, we have to keep, keep doing that. Keep working on that. I'm both world Superbike and MotoGP. How do well, you, let me, let me, I know Harry's got one there. Harry's got one yeah. right in the tube there, ready to fire Go. across, but uh, let me tell, mm-hmm. let me tell, this is a, to blow a bit of smoke up your trouser leg here, Dan, if I may, because one of the notes that I made, um, I, I obviously did a little bit of research before we met you today. <laughs> I've never met you before. And um, and across the board from some management and uh, some fairly high ups, very nice, genuine guy is what came down. I wrote it down on my piece of paper that's in front there of you. There you go. Here. Thank so you. That 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 walk down the pit lane, just because they won't ever tell you what they're thinking, mm-hmm. because that's the nature of the beast in the paddock, of yeah. course. Um, but they, but the, the the genuine feedback that I got from doing a bit of research over the last couple of days was exactly that's that. Good. So. Uh, it is very good right. from the point of view that you have people on side, so people that are, are wanting you to be successful in the direction you're heading in. Oh, I would say, I would My say, I what? can't, I could not, and I say it all the time. We have such a congenial paddock, and I think that they've been so they were so welcoming, so welcoming to new ideas, and I, and I try to reciprocate that as much as possible because. There's no ownership over good ideas. <laughs> There's no monopoly. Do you have the power? Oh yeah. Yeah, I would say, listen, again, go back to that, Keith. Like, no, if I wanted to say I, I wanted to put a race at night, I think Carlos would smack me over the head and say, yeah, great. No, we can't do what you, yeah, you, we can, but if there's a lot of, you know what I mean? Like, I do have, I, I listen, there's no, they have not said no to me. What I'm also trying to do, though, is I am, uh, I am picking my spots, Keith. I, we are picking our spots. Where are we going to, where do I have capital? Where do I have um, opportunities to do things collectively. Um, I think that I have the power to do a lot of different things. I, again, there's never been a no, there's been a, there's been, okay, let's talk about it. But from my perspective, the really outstanding thing that I've always heard is a willingness to change and willingness to, it's almost as if people in the paddock, people at Dorna, people in the executive committee, they know we have this gem and they're like, Dan, let us know how we have to show it off and let us know what we have to do to show it off. And um, it's been great in that regard to try to really identify with people. Just coming back to what you were saying about sort of working with teams and, yeah. and how that can be a sort of love-hate relationship. One of the things um, I've noticed, particularly with MotoGP, is access, mm. both for, for fans and also for, for media of yeah. all types. You know, at the moment, we're trying to, you know, get, booking interviews and things like that with, with with current riders and and across the classes and some teams have been absolutely brilliant in allowing yeah. us time you know half an hour with whoever it might be yeah. but some are still you know no, no matter what point of the year it might be can be quite tricky they'll offer you a time but it has to be during the race weekend and it's only 10 minutes and right, yeah. you're, you're not get you're not getting much out of anybody in 10 minutes and, and the reason I think I, I have an issue with it is because coming from Formula One is it's uh, surprisingly it's really easy to get interviews with riders. Okay, it's still hard, but it's they're a lot more willing. But the other thing is, and I wonder if you agree with Valentino Rossi's departure over right. the last couple of years. MotoGP's taken a huge hit with that because 
you didn't I you didn't need to know anything about motorbike racing but you would know who Valentino Rossi is or you'd know oh he's that he's that racer isn't he oh yeah no he now no, the quote is he is racing he is racing. <laughs> true you know but he's not but not in MotoGP well, well and and I I he was a personality and I know there are huge personalities in up and down that paddock within the rider department but it feels like no, they're not being allowed or we're not given the opportunity to try and extract those. Yeah. Um, it is a fair criticism. It is a good point. It is something that we are constantly addressing with our guys. And I've seen market improvements. And I'll and I'll just give you a little bit of, I don't know, this is not news because it's not that news. We're, we're having a, we have, we're, I'm going to Doha next week. We have a meeting with the teams. And one of those things is to talk about how we can prioritize rider time and use it better to get to maximize exposure. So this will come up, I'm sure. Um, and I, I listen, I get it. I get it. Like we had, they are our best ambassadors for the sport or none. They are our yeah. best ambassadors for the sport. So we have to get them out there. And that's funny because coming from outside of the sport, I think we are so accessible in terms of so many things, different things. Like if you see these guys in the paddock and like there's all of a sudden like, you know, whatever it might be, they're just very accessible. I've never, you know, it's been rare that I've heard a no from them personally either. Maybe that's because they see me as some sort of boss, but like we are premium and we are accessible, which I think is a great, is a great position, but these guys have to be, we have to prioritize their time much better. And that means maybe eliminating stuff that we've done in the past that we were like, okay, you're right. We don't need to do that as Dorna, as MotoGP. We will, we'll, we'll take that off your plate. You have to do this more. So I do mm-hmm. think, Harry, it's a good point. It's something that we're addressing because I I want these stories to be told. <laughs> I want these guys to tell. I think what they do is so spectacular and so wonderful. I want people to hear about it. And I do want um, our personalities built up because sports in today's world, as you know, there's a lot of competition for eyeballs. There's a lot of comp- competition for time. And it's not just sports, it's entertainment. I mean, what we were, were just probably a few years on the downside of peak television, they called it, with all every greatest show of all time was every but also you're you know, you're competing with news programming. You're competing with walking your dog. You're competing with like going to your you know, you're competing with so many different things. The way to do that is to extract that personality out of people so that they can identify with these riders that I'm gonna tune in for forty five minutes on Sunday. It is not a heavy ask. And now I'd love them to tune in for practice and qualifying and the sprint on Saturday and all that. And they have shown that they will do that. But it's we need these personalities to be that magnetic um, attraction for our fans. Is there been a movement um, behind the scenes to kind of make MotoGP a bit more elite compared with Moto2 and Moto3. What I'm specifically talking about is Sunday's programming now. Yeah. Um, we've not got warm-ups for Moto3 and Moto2 because we've got the track presentation of MotoGP riders and so on taking up time for the audience at track side pretty much more than it will be for television. Um, as a former rider, obviously yeah, of course. I'm very concerned about that. Um, lack of track time on a Sunday um, purely and simply because I think Moto3 and Moto2 should be have track time yeah. before racing on the day um, just as a matter of testing time to, to sort out any niggling problems and so on that they may have. But is there, I mean, my question is not about that. My question is, is there a movement behind the scenes to make MotoGP just that little bit more elitist over the lower class? Yeah, I, I, if there is, I have not received the memo. Okay. <laughs> no, I don't think there is. I actually think Moto, the, Moto3 to me is... Crazy. Crazy. <laughs> My wife can't watch it. She literally, yeah. she, she goes like, she cannot watch it. Like, she's like that. Yeah. So I, I know I want, at, I'll be honest with you. At, it, first of all, Pedro Acosta coming out of Moto2. It's like, I kept telling people last year, can you please watch him? And then, and Aldeguer as well. Um, so like, you know, there's a lot of talent that comes up. So I, I want people to learn who our new stars are. But if you, if you had a camera on me or recording, Every new person, new sponsor, new media company, new uh, television company, whatever it might be, I talk to. I'm like, please just watch Moto Three as well. Just, just put it on. Just, just put it on for 15 minutes, and you tell me what you think about it. 
And they're all like, okay, I will. And sometimes I get texts or emails going, holy cow. It's, um, <laughs> it's interesting. It's, uh, it, it, really, it really is one of the highlights of the weekend when you're watching it. Um, yeah. Now, Dan, we are uh, running out of time with you, but um, we had quite a lot of listener questions here. We've no, asked some away. of them throughout, throughout the show, but um, uh, one of the, uh, the, it's better the priorities... It's better to so I don't get killed on Twitter for not answering. Well, no, Please exactly. You want... Please ask I, have asked, I have asked a few already, just in the build-up. You know, Good. Luke asked about Trackhouse and, and uh, was wondering uh, as well as a follow-up to his question... Um, what about Moto America? You, you say there is a plan, you know, that you yep. are working with Trackhouse to try and get an American rider. Are you monitoring Moto America? Are you able to work with them uh, to, to see where the next talent can come from? We saw them last in uh, a couple of weeks ago in the US. We will see them again. I, you know, I will see them again in Austin, obviously. It was, it was actually my first meeting, official meeting, when I was at MotoGP in Austin last year. It was with Moto America, with Wayne and the team there. So yeah, we are definitely in conversation with them as well Brilliant. Some, yeah absolutely and uh i we uh, there was a lot of names and i don't uh, know if you one, saw but... harry if you saw like at austin this year we're gonna have the bag mm. the king of the baggers racing yes so that's a that's a collaboration with them which we think is just fun right it's it's this is this, what sports is about so it's another good collaboration yeah Jer jeremy mcwilliams is campaigning for a lower age limit yeah. so nobody under 50 uh, is allowed there you go, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> well well you know what um on that peter emailed in yep. saying uh, the americans are looking to host a bagger racing support race instead of uh, the moto e for the u.s round um and seeing uh, this focuses more on moto e now seeing as moto e series in general albeit very exciting for the riders seems a bit dull for traditional racing fans uh what are the moods around monitoring Moto E? Can yep. we have better marketing around that? Or should we just replace it with uh, with bagger racing? No, we shouldn't. But yes, we should make it more exciting. How about that? I think it's fair. I think there you go, Peter. Well, he, There's your question. The interesting thing, though, if you, I mean, if you talk to Neil Morrison or something, who did a lot of the... He thinks the Moto E racing was actually pretty darn good. I think, and I'm going to say this, and I, I'm sorry to whoever is going to get... It's a weird thing without sound. It's a weird thing. Like sound, I think it's, it's, and I think it's a, it, you know, these bikes are really good. The Ducatis this year were amazing. Amazing. Though every rider who got on one was like, holy cow, they're so much better and so, so different. It's a weird thing. Like the sound is a visceral part of our sport, right? It's like, I get chills. I just got chills thinking about what it sounds like when these guys first put those bikes on. So I think that's a part of it. But I, I think we have some, look, a hundred percent we've got to market it better and we've got really great partners who are getting behind it so we've got to do our bit to market it better as well mm. i think as a trackside um visual um there's not enough races yeah effectively i mean you've got three races i think that if you are and i think this is a problem for silverstone to, to some extent i mean if you could have a british championship race that was going to be run during the, the weekend as well or over the weekend that would work quite well Stay tuned. Um, one of my Stay tuned, worries Keith. is, is it, Stay tuned. Stay Sorry, tuned. Dad. Stay tuned. He <laughs> Stay said. Stay tuned. Well, as long as it, as long as it doesn't go down the Formula One MotoGP together no. kind of weekend, because I, I I kind of can't see. Well, I can I can see it being a spectacle. That's a stunt. The problems you're going to have with it, you, you guys are going to be out sweeping the track, yeah. um, before and after every single thing that's going on, just to get the debris yeah, out yeah, of the yeah. way for bikes to be on it completely different racing line. I do love how people say those things, and they like you guys should just do that. Oh yeah, sure. It's easy. Sure. It, it really, it really is not easy, and 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 the safety, the safety side of things for cars and for bikes are com completely yes. different. It's a conflict that we have all of the 100%. time. Um, but I mean, getting back to the, the the Moto E type situation as well. I mean, we're obviously heading towards sustainable fuels. We're moving away. Not to, we're not going down the electric route quite so much. I mean, I think that again, this is another coup that um, Dorna pulled off when they they. They brought the the electric bike thing under their wing rather than have what we had in cars, where Bernie didn't want anything to do with it, and it buggered off in a different direction and um, produced its own series in competition with Formula One, which was never really going to work. But anyway, <laughs> yeah. um, look, we, we I think so. Thinking... More more races trackside. That's what you're. Are you moving towards more races trackside? Or is that a, a possibility? possibility. You think? Are, are you work, possibility. Are you working with the likes of? of MSVR for Jonathan Palmer, Stuart Higgs, and that mob um, in the UK. A mob is such, I mean, a mob I is such think... an impolite word, especially mob. Yeah, we... on purpose. 
<laughs> we are. We're talking to them. I think it's a combination of every. I think we listen. We and I will say this is like again. I'm not trying to kiss anyone's ass here. Be sycophantic. We're looking at a lot of different stuff, and we're like we're willing to like we're willing to do things. I think it's just a matter of getting the right mix. We and we might fail at stuff, Keith. Like we might just that ah, that didn't work. That's okay. That's okay. I, by the way, I tell my team all the time. It's okay if it didn't work. Let's figure out why, what could work better, and let, then just put in the rearview mirror and go. So, have you had a conversation with um, Jonathan or Stuart yeah. I mean, have you? Have... Yes. Stuart's not allowed on races because he's obviously a, a, a steward. He yeah, is. So yes, we have. Um, he's a, I mean, he's another guy that um, I, I, you know, like Dorner. I, I rate Stuart Higgs very, very yep. highly, and his, his his skills are very, very big fan. I mean, he's a very smart big fan. fella. But he runs a kind of. Um, how shall I put this? It's going to be rude, whichever way I put it. But basically, <laughs> he's, he's he's kind of bordering on dictator in that he makes things happen. Yeah, no, no. You know, and generally, and the reason why it's been allowed to go the way it has is because generally, he's always no, right. I, listen, <laughs> Which, the benefit, that would be then called a benevolent dictator. Mm. <laughs> well, before well, we get long to... Long may it last and, to... and long may a collaboration between... One of the problems that we have in the UK here is it's not a close enough link between... Um, British racing and MotoGP. Yeah, I agree. Um, as much as, um, you know, Dorna have been massive in the, the funding British riders here, and they still continue to do that now. Um, Jake Dixon wouldn't even be where he is if it wasn't for the fact that, that Dorna were weighing in. You know, I mentioned Jeremy Williams earlier. We're going to be seeing him in baggers. But, um, I mean, Jeremy was funded originally by Dorna. He wouldn't have been racing in Grand Prix if it wouldn't be the fact that they put some money. Rory Skinner is another one that's had a little bit of cash out yep. of it. Um, but kind of... I feel like there's a massive disjoint between what's going on here in Britain. Sorry if you're listening from around the world. We are a global um, platform, um, and I'm talking very British centric at the moment. But but we don't we, we we have this disjoint between British racing and Grand Prix. Yeah, it's okay to World Superbikes. That link seems to work fairly well. But we we kind of lost the plot when it comes to getting guys into into the the top classes. Yeah, I think we're gonna we're listen. We're like I said, we talked to Stuart, and I hope I hope you'll be seeing something from us regarding Silverstone shortly. Well, uh, we look forward, look forward to, to seeing that. that. Dan, uh, we've taken up enough of your time. Thank you so much. It's been such an insight to chat with you. Before oh. we go, though, one sure. final question. Yeah, absolutely. Who is your bet? Who's your bet for this year's MotoGP champion? Whoa. And we will hold you to this and we'll come back to it yeah. right at the end of the year. Yeah, and I, 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 the reason why I hate these questions is because I can't not answer them. I've got this like <laughs> unbelievable, like I can't not, I can't help myself. I can't give the political answer. Like everybody gets deserves a trophy. Um, yeah. I think it's the hardest question in the world. I think this year, Jorge Martin is going to win the championship with Mark, okay. Mark, 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 Mark Marquez a close second. I'll tell you what, it's a good shell. Martin's been my man for the last couple of years. Yeah. He's failed me every time. Is this his time? That's why he's 2024 the year. Talk about a guy who only knows one way. Like, just like he, every time I see him yeah. after he wins a race, he comes up to me and goes, yeah, I mean, like it's, <laughs> so I, think, I think he learned a lot last yes, year. He, he's, I think he's got a wonderful team around him. I think he's just a big fan of his father's, by the way. I think he's just a great guy. And uh, I, yeah, I think it's worried, but Mark is Mark and Pecco is Pecco. So I, I listen to, and then, I think there's gonna be a lot of good storylines, but I think Jorge is gonna yeah, pick Pedro Acosta. Mm. Dude. Let me let me bring a big bucket of cold water with ice okay. in there, shall I, just for a moment and we'll tip it on this story. Because I mean what's gonna make the difference this year is the collaboration regarding tires, boring as the subject is, because they've only just really put together. It's yet to be ratified, but we're talking about um we're not gonna get disqualified now if mm. you're outside of the tire range. The tire range is gonna be a little be- bit bigger changing depending on what track we're on so there's a lot more autonomy coming up out you know team wise as we move forward i'm pretty sure it will be ratified but there's going to be a time penalty situation so if somebody is not um complied with 60 percent of the race within the tire pressure rule so there's a few things that are going to be coming up so it's still to be yep. ratified at the moment but that's the the the, the, the underlying thing um because i don't know about you dan sorry to keep no you. no um but the disqualification of someone because they've been uh, too low a tire pressure for fifty percent of the race, and we've got three guys on the on the podium, and 
potentially those aren't the three guys that are going to be the, the, the one, two, three by the time they've read the data and seen that someone had low tyre pressures. That would be a massive turnoff for the sport and for everybody watching. You saw my face. Like, yeah, that was like, we were <laughs> we were coming in and going into Valencia and Doha. We were like, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't my great, I didn't have the greatest uh, feeling in my stomach thinking about that. I would say the other guy that I would mention, Harry, and I should have, is Brad Binder. I think he just like, Boom, 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 and he just is kind of, and I KT, I KTM between him and Acosta and Miller and August. I think they're gonna. I, I, I kind of. If I was like, I'd give, give you a wild card. He's the wild card. Okay. He's the wild. Thing is, yeah. what this underlines is is that there are so many storylines, personalities, and things to tune in. Who's gonna win this Formula year? One this year? <laughs> oh, oh, that's a hard one. <laughs> ah. Oh, that's not fair. That wasn't I'm, fair. I'm sorry. But hang on, wait. Give 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 us a year, because then Hamilton's yeah. in a Ferrari, and then it, and then it gets go. good, and then it gets good. There you, you know. go. There you, you gotta go. get you gotta okay. get through the boring seasons before there the, the new plot twist there comes you in. Go. Uh, well, I think it's a good time to leave it there, shall we? Uh, <laughs> Dan, <laughs> Dan Thanks, Rosamund, no, thank you so much uh, for joining us on OMG. It's a pleasure. Take care. So, Keith, we've just got off the phone with Dan Rosamundo. I must say, I'm one over. Lovely bloke. Took the time to have a lovely chat with us uh, off air as well. And and not afraid to, you know, say a, a spade is a spade. Tricky position he's in. Mm. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to hold back a little bit on too much praise at the moment. But the general, <laughs> I, I wasn't, I, I obviously wasn't being, uh, how shall I say, too praiseworthy at the time. I mean, I think that the proof of the pudding is going to be in the eating and whether whatever he manages to move Dorna towards. I mean, at the end of the day, he's on an uphill slope. Mm. You know, the marketplace for MotoGP in some countries is slipping. In others, it's absolutely flattened out. And in some, it's going to tank. Um, Dorna have got an ongoing problem keeping momentum going. We've got a great sport but it's lacking in so many areas. And, and Dan has got a fairly short window to make that work for him and for us. I mean, obviously, I was talking very much about Silverstone and the, the British perspective. And I apologize again to anyone listening around the world. No, we did a lot on the US Some of you well. have got... Well, that's exactly right. The US have got problems. Argentina's been cancelled now because they've got problems. Um, you know, there are a lot of things that, that need writing. But for me, the way that... Um, youngsters receive their sport the way that youngsters perceive their sport we are missing out a massive block of people that are eventually going to move into the position of uh, having enough money having enough you know influence to be able to move our sport forward what we've got at the moment is a load of gray hairs you know like me we've got a lot of older people the majority of people that are that are spending money that are going to tracks that are buying motorbikes are older people um, that is not good because we're all going to drop off the edge of the bloody cliff at some stage, and we're relying on moving a, a, the youngsters through into our sport and to be enthusiastic about our sport. And that's what worries me to a great extent, is how much we're catering for those guys. We need, you know, the, the, the digital side is, is more important than I think any of us really give, give credit for. Um, and I think that, that, that sorting that out, I, mean, I mentioned in the, in the conversation with Dan about the Bernieism. that was a, I was alluding, obviously, to Bernie Eccleston, who was 1,000% against digital marketing. He didn't let drivers make any kind of digital uh, communication from trackside. There was nothing you know, allowable to go outside of the paddock. All completely wrong if you want to connect with your younger younger sports fan. The younger sports fan wants to be integrated into that, wants to, to be a part of that. And I think that that's missing massively, even in the Dorna situation, which is a great shame because if we coordinate that with I mentioned Sergi Sendra earlier on. I mean, he's fantastic the way that they, the developments they've got and the technology that they're producing really is, you know, make, could make our, our sport so accessible um, on all the platforms that are available. But um, Dan, Dan's the man and he's got a hell of a job to do. Well, it's like, well, we were talking, albeit in a, in a different sort of context just before we recorded, how quick things move nowadays you know especially in this in this most sport industry particularly on the digital and the media side and and dan said you know 
that we want to get things right i'm happy to fail and and figure out why that didn't happen but as you also said he has got a limited window to make that happen because people expect things quickly now and yes i'm sure you know but dan could do stuff in, in a given you know five a ten year plan but really this needs to happen sooner rather than later but that's a hard task as again from a british perspective as far as silverson is concerned we are we've already run out of time the negative feelings regarding Silverstone Motor GP meeting are already too far the wrong side of that tipping point. We almost need a situation at Silverstone that is an explosion mm. in as much as come for free Friday and Saturday. It's almost a, 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 an absolute radical way of thinking. Everybody can come for free on a Friday and Saturday. Parking for free. It's, it's, it's almost like they've got to take the hit for, for one year to bring people back. They have got to take an almighty smash in the teeth financially to make it work, to get people back on site. Because what's happened is everybody's moaning before we even get to the event. It's not even about the event. It's everybody is already whinging about, oh, I won't go to Silverstone because of this. I won't go to Silverstone because of that. And to, to, to turn that tide is going to take something massive to get everybody back on site. But they, um, they also yeah. need to do a, you know, not only that, but in the British press, they, and and this goes for any track that is, uh, you know, not meeting its its demands, you need to fork out the money for, for your PR. You need to be getting, we need in the build-up, you know, a month before most GP at Silverstone, on the back page of the Telegraph Sports or whatever it might be, you need Jake Dixon alongside Pecco Banyai and Mark Marquez. And you need to go... MotoGP is happening. What is it? Who are the people? This is it's free on a Friday and Saturday. Go and watch it. But that needs to be implemented across print and digital, you know, months in advance before it actually happens. And they need to fork out to to hopefully in the long run make it all back and then some. In my well, book. we talked about it in the in the interview. We talked about it in the interview about NASCAR, IndyCar, mm. and so on. Well, NASCAR has a constitution that is really fan centric. At the end of the day, you know, they're super accessible it's written into the constitution of, of nascar that they will do this that and the other regarding pr um you talked about the fact that you know get, getting interviews with dry, riders was was quite tricky and it is i mean like we've, we've got people lined up but it's taken a lot of effort to get to that point for omg motor gp um i i just i just feel that the the silverson situation needs a massive turnaround mm. and there are one or two others that that might be in the same position now that we've lost you know valentino rossi if you've mentioned already that has made a big difference to italian figures you know to the to the attendance figures and so on and so forth and it will do for a while you know uh Mar marquez is still the biggest name and he's still the man that you know you put Mark marquez on a headline we've noticed that on omg motor gp if it's a Mark marquez headline it gets the hits unless it's colin edwards he gets the most hits still <laughs> <laughs> we love colin he did do well back, colin edwards for president <laughs> welcome did back anytime <laughs> um, um yeah but look. i i i i just think that i think dan rosamondo has got a massive massive task and i wonder if one man can persuade promoters dorna teams to move in the direction they need to move in we need a bit of an explosion um in some marketplaces to make this move to get people back and to get MotoGP on track. Um, and I think the thinking is lagging behind what we need um, to start getting things. I mean, you know, from schools, from right the way through from, from youngsters, we need that to move forward. You know, Moto America is miles behind because everybody in Moto America is older. Everybody in uh, British Superbikes is older. You know, the Spanish market, the reason why we see so many Spanish is because Spanish and Italians you know, are in warmer countries and they promote their stuff from very, very young and, and, and riders are, are playing, you know, alongside their, their school studies, they're riding motorbikes on, you know, little tiny go-kart tracks and so on. You know, the whole thing. The fact that Silverstone has basically reneged on, on, the, on the conversation I had with Stuart Pringle, you know, two years ago regarding their new kart track and they're not interested in running, you know, mini bikes around the kart track because they might, you know, dig in the tarmac with footrests and stuff and cause a, a problem for the tarmac. Well, so what? You've got a MotoGP coming up. You need to be promoting young riders on 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 your home track, and and that doesn't seem to be happening now. Um, so I mean, uh, I can't see it changing. 
I can't. I can't I, the, my prediction will be is Silverstone will eventually lose interest, even though it's a it's it's the the second biggest thing that they hold there. And MSVR, Jonathan Palmer and his group will pick it up and it will go to Donington Park um, for a while. Now, there will be a lot of people that's just cheered that are listening to this and said, yeah, we want a bit of that. Um, I love Donington Park. Um, I've got a good relationship with MSVR. <laughs> I will have until I've said this. Um, but I still, I still enjoy... Silverstone is a special racetrack. It's a special venue. It's a special event. And to see it slipping downhill makes me cry. You know, I... I I, I can't believe where we are with it. Well, we, we know, and uh, I know all the listeners will know how passionate Keith is about Silverstone. And you said you've got a meeting with him tomorrow. We'll see if Stuart wants to come on the podcast for a little guest, as a, a guest spot. Uh, he's, he's already, I, I, I had a conversation with him earlier on today. And, and Stuart Pringle is managing director of Silverstone. He is a man that, that is juggling quite a few plates. There's no doubt about that. Formula One dictates everything that he does pretty much. They've just done a 10-year deal. For Formula One, MotoGP has got a while to go yet, so um, that's going to continue to happen. I wonder how restricted he is by others within, you know, Silverstone's management as to what he can do or can't do. We well, you know what? Um, give give, give yeah. me his email, and I'll send him a <laughs> send him a line <laughs> and see if I can wordsmith him onto uh, onto the podcast. I reckon that'll be a good. A well, good I mean, he's, he's he 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 will come on because again, again, he's a great front man. He's a very good orator. He's he's very eloquent. Um, you know, I, I I want to hold his feet to the fire regarding the um the uh, little track that we've got for the for the go karts there or the carts I can't call them go karts. It sounds like it's a bloody seaside parade. Um, <laughs> Somewhere in but Great But it, it is it is something that that I I do think that they need holding to certain things and I, and I, and I wonder why we're not seeing the kind of change. You know, they put on a good band at night on a Friday, put on a good band, albeit not for long. It's not like a proper concert, but. Um, on Saturday night as well. We've got the Day of Champions, of course, on the Thursday build-up, which I think really needs developing. That's not developing in the way that it should do. Um, you can look at other um, events like Daytona. Um, Dan did say off-air, there's, there's, he, he, I'm not going to spoil the confidence, but he said off-air a minute ago before, as, as he finished um, that we do have an extra something on track that's coming um, at Silverstone. So, my question about not enough races going on during the day, not enough for British fans to, to get you know, their teeth into, um, that will change this year. It's 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 not quite signed off yet. but um, So you can look forward to that. Keep an eye out for that. But there is something coming special at Silverstone. Yeah, there certainly is. Um, I'm just saying, I think we're, we're sort of nearly out of time, Keith. So unless there's, there's anything major. I know, I know, I just, I can, I know you love Silverstone, but I don't want to go down the rabbit hole there anymore. <laughs> no, um, I, I do, and 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 I, I would I would love to see the Grand Prix back in the days when we were getting a hundred thousand people at trackside. Um, but I think that, like I say, that, that that there's a fair bit of ill will and too much bad PR that that we're not getting ahead of. And I think that you know get, getting the the, the the fans back on side, it's a very important thing, and they need giving something. They need they need to see that that, that they're loved and that, that we want them there, rather than the the whore cut the hardcore. Forty-five thousand people that came last year. Yeah, it needs to be. It needs to be more than that. It needs to be. You know, we need to get give all the kids, anybody under thirteen, for free. They can come for for stay there for a month, and we'll buy them all. Give them all a free, flops. free, uh, free ice cream with a with a flake for free on the house. Thanks. Need, <laughs> need, we need something. We need something to get them back on site. Well, look. Uh, thanks again to Dan Rosmonda for joining us. Thank you, as always, for tuning in to the OMG MotoGP podcast. I think we're going to sort of be back fairly regularly now, which is quite nice. Um, so, uh, as I said at the start, we've got Renita and Amy joining the show. Pete's going to be making sporadic appearances when his schedule allows, uh, alongside myself and Keith Hewin. Uh, we have got Sam Lowe's and Alex Lowe's on the way in a Down the Pub special. Uh, we have also got brad binder lined up for you that's an exciting one uh augusto fernandez is going to join the show we're going to try and catch up with pedro acosta about halfway through the season but as you can imagine imagine he's very focused on uh, getting uh his head in the game for uh, the opening rounds and so much more so Drop us a like, a subscribe, a comment. It goes a massive long way. We have a Patreon page as well you can subscribe to, which means you'll get early access uh, to everything we do. Uh, and uh, feedback is always uh, available and welcome uh, for how we can improve the show. Um, but I think that just about does it for the time being. MotoGP, I think, is pretty much back now. Uh, Keith Ewan, thank you very much for your company. We'll catch up with Dan 
at the end of the year and see how it all folded out. I've been Harry Benjamin. We'll see you next time. Bye.